Good morning. Welcome to the Long Live Alternative Parties podcast. Free Press Media Press Inc. and Alternative Parties Books Publisher sponsors this podcast. I'm Andrew Bouchard. Welcome to the Long Live Alternative Parties podcast. Today, friends, we have another exciting guest for this podcast. This individual put together a page called Vote for a Third Party, Any Third Party. So welcome to the podcast. Uh, thanks, Andrew. I'm glad to be here. Let us get started by kindly giving us an introduction to yourself, a brief biographical sketch. Uh, well, I'm a software engineer in my 40s, and I've lived around the country, uh, the United States, that is, and uh, I also lived in Europe for a decade. Uh, I've worked in a bunch of interesting projects, which maybe we can get into, but probably aren't too relevant here. Uh, politically, which is, I guess, ultimately what we are here to discuss. Uh, I've been all over (laughs) uh, at different times of my life exploring uh, different things. And so uh, basically I've put together over time a view or set of views which don't really belong anywhere on the left, right, uh, either or fallacy paradigm that is the, you know, status quo. And I can't remember now if it was for the 2012 election or the 2016 election that I originally created that site. It's Uh been around for a long time. (laughs) Uh, But uh, I'm still, you know, more than happy to have a conversation with you because, in general, uh, I think a huge majority of people, whether it's from the left or the right or what have you, uh, recognize that there's a lot about the system that isn't working, uh, or it sure. isn't working for them the way that it, it ought to be, and yes. uh, I'm sympathetic to that uh, situation, regardless of what part of the political spectrum you happen to hail from. So sure. I don't know if that's uh, useful, but uh, hopefully, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Actually, so, uh, and we talked about this offline. I don't know if this is a good time to interject. I actually was hoping to ask you about you. I didn't oh, really okay. know who you were when you messaged me, and uh, I'm really impressed with your your podcast. Uh, I mean, there's improvements to be made for sure, but uh, I'm really impressed with what it is that you're doing. It's like I was listening to a bunch of different episodes, and there doesn't seem to be a particular uh, slant to it. You know, you just give the platform to a lot of different types of people and let them talk, and I think that's something that this country really needs, you know, rather than people shouting over each other or whatever. And uh, having also, you know, views that are uh, well outside of, you know, what you hear on television or probably even a lot of podcasts. And so uh, I, I appreciate that you don't inject yourself a lot, but it also left me curious about, you know, who you were and how you got started with this and, you, you know, your motivations for doing what I think uh, seems to be a pretty good endeavor. So, Sure. Thank you, sir. Yes. That is the goal to present a wide variety of views and like your page I have I wrote in one of my books that I haven't met a third party or an alternative party I haven't liked so I I am very fond of alternative parties and their background and all they do as for me this this podcast is part of a small business that I run called Free Press Media Press Inc a book publishing company we focus on the First Amendment, so all the different parts of the First Amendment, we publish books about ranging from obscenity to alternative parties to religious freedom. Like The First Amendment contains several different causes, so we want to advance every part of the cause, every part of the First Amendment. So Man, therefore, <laughs> Yeah. This is one of my highest virtues, so, you know. <laughs> yes, yes. The, I started the business in 2013, and then I went full time with it in 2020. Now I do do some other self-employment things to supplement it. Yet, for those of you who are out there who want to not be employed by someone else, I I am proof that you can do it. I I will say it's not necessarily an easy thing. There are challenges, it, challenges that probably vary from person to person, business to business, different circumstances, and and it feels like I've had to make sacrifices. Yet, 
the costs to me are worth it, especially as what I see as ultimate vision. So I hear other people have different businesses and they have different struggles and different sacrifices they have to make. So that's, so it is possible and it is doable. And, and like I said, I went full time in 2020 and I'm not looking back and I don't plan to ever work for wages again. So, so, and I'm, I'm, I'm I'm about your age. You said you were in your forties. So I'm in my forties too. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't want somebody to run a business from day one, the, from 18 to up, because I do think there it's good experience to work for others and it's good experiences to do a, a wide variety of employment. I don't want to be the type of person who thinks certain employment is beneath me. So I'm glad to have done a lot of different employment over the years. And, and yeah, John, I, mean, I would completely agree with that. Uh, also the experience that you get Basic. I mean, I, I'm. I know we mentioned. I'm also working on starting something, and basically, the 20 years of ex- regular experience I had was basically informing me, you know, actually what needed to be done and how that wasn't being done right el- elsewhere. So, yeah, I, I completely agree. It's like all that experience of whatever you do beforehand. It's really necessary. I, I think. I'm not going to say someone can't start a business uh, when they're when they're younger, but I think that there there's a lot of truth in what you're saying, and you probably have yes. an edge of already having connections and and whatever. So, man, I think yes. you're uh, giving good advice, and <laughs> that's also yes. encouraging. With you. And I'll be, so yeah, anyway, I, I didn't yeah, I've interrupt had, you. Go ahead. Yeah, I've had I've had bosses and other people who. I had one boss. I used to work for the school system, and I had one boss. She was 22 years old. Her first job was she was one of the most important people in the school. So she never got a chance to be in a humbling position, whereas I have been in those positions, and like other people say, that gives you empathy so you can hopefully when you're – if you get into another position – you can use that perspective to empower and inspire others. <laughs> Man, I I agree with that considerably. Uh, there's nothing that will give you humility like you know having some wannabe gangster threatening you at Taco Bell for having not having enough cheese on his taco, and you're like, "Man, I'm not even making the tacos; they're right in the counter." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so yeah, like it's true. There's a lot of stuff in, in uh, work, you know, regardless of whether it's a uh, starting job like that or even much more professional ones that suck, but yeah, yep. uh, all those things through character and experience, so. <laughs> yep. And also, yeah, exactly. Also, one thing I've been thinking about today is, have you ever read a book called Peaks and Valleys? Uh, no, I don't think so. Okay, it's by Spencer Johnson and the and another guy, Ken, Ken Blanchard. Spencer Johnson and Ken Blanchard, they both have written a lot of motivational books, often usually in the form of parables. And this is this book is a parable. And to me, it has hold, held true to my life. I like to think a lot of in the – I read the motivational books and see a lot of analogies. I like you – know, I, I do say this about motivational works. You do have to – weigh that against other stuff because a lot of times they can be naive about things or they can not some of them don't have experiences so they for example to be brief I'll give a brief example I heard one guy one motivational speaker on a podcast say there's no system holding you down which is something he he was he's a white male a white heterosexual male so a lot of people are going to say no that's not true so, so th- sometimes motivational works can be that way where they don't recognize oppression and injustice in the world that we see. Yet at the same time, I don't think we should wallow in that oppression and injustice. We should be use the good stuff of the motivational things to pull us through because there's a lot of stories about people overcoming stuff no matter what their position in society. So that that is true. So that book uses the metaphor of peaks and valleys for life where it says you there's ups and downs 
especially, especially if you are a high achiever. It argues that, ironically, if you're the type of person that doesn't want to do much in life, you're going to have less peaks and valleys. So sometimes you may see someone always in these valleys. It may not necessarily be because they're a loser. It may be because, because the opposite, because the, the book says to get to the next peak, you have to go through a valley every time, every time. So it's inevitable. Man, that, that is really excellent. Uh, can I make an observation on that, that Go point, for it. actually? Go for so, it. So, uh, uh, well, okay, I realize we're mainly here to uh, discuss politics eventually uh, and not uh, religion. And I, I'm not uh, particularly religious, uh, but I was uh, raised such, and I I read uh, most of the you know, the Bible and the Quran and the Bhagavad Gita. Actually, I didn't finish the Quran, I confess. Uh, Confucius, uh, the Tao, a bunch of different points of view. And uh, one of the uh, things that I often think about is the story of Joseph, which is shared. Uh, yeah. In the, and regardless of whether the story is, you know, true or actually happens, I, you know, there's a lot of people uh Man, I, I may be going to get in trouble already. You know, there's there's a lot of historically and even today, I would say there's anti-Semitism in the world. And yeah. you know, sometimes I've asked like, why why is this? And I think there's a a bunch of reasons. That's a really deep conversation, but oh, there yeah. is at least some amount of it uh, that I think comes uh, from envy because there oh, tends okay. to be a disproportional success. Uh, and you, hmm. and, but when I add, when if you think about why you can think about like think about the story of Joseph, which is core to their mythology, right? Yeah. Uh, and like I said, to whatever degree the story is true uh, or you know based on true uh, a true story, I I couldn't tell you. I'm sure there are certainly people who think it's all absolutely true, and other people who would think it's not. I I kind of find that question irrelevant. The moral of the story is you have a guy here who has, like, the worst things possible. His own brothers uh, sell him into slavery. He gets falsely accused of rape. Like, all this, uh, he gets thrown in prison. Uh, Like, all these bad things happen to him, but he he continues to have, uh, you know, strong moral character and a good work ethic. And despite everything that happens, he basically becomes the hand of the king of Egypt, which uh, at the time, like, Egypt was the world's superpower, right? So, you know, now I don't think that's a sort of exceptional uh, success story. And like I said, it might not even, it might may even be fictional, in which case it's more of a parable example. Uh, And I think, uh, you know, an individual will have varying success in their lives, but the the reality is, is like, no matter where you are in life, uh, the only upward trajectory is like those things of, you know, trying to have a a strong moral character and having a good work ethic and persevering through whatever things happen. And there's absolutely injustice in the world. Uh, Personally, I think that there's uh, some problems with the, and and it's politically divisive about framing it exclusively around, uh, you know, sexuality or race or whatever. And I'm not saying that people haven't had, uh, difficulties or, or persecution or whatever for those things, but uh, and uh, and there's certainly people who you know literally uh, don't have a whole lot of opposition, but fighting about those things is ultimately not serving you or anybody else. The best thing to do to overcome that, whatever your obstacles are, are those traits. And mm-hmm. while there's other factors uh, that go in. Personally, uh, I think one of the reasons that uh, Jewish culture tends to succeed regardless or or, (laughs) succeed, they tend to do well as as they can do in whatever environment or whatever persecution or hatred or whatever uh, that's going on is probably at least in part attributable to things like the fact that this is core and their their mythology. And I think there's other stories that, would make you ask that sort of like, oh, hey, maybe whatever's going on is wrong and and just or whatever, but still what did I do wrong and what can I improve? Mm -hmm. Because ultimately at the end of the day, that's all that you have control over. And so uh, anyway, I I thought that I would put that out there. I'm not saying that there haven't been uh, other factors, uh, some just and some unjust and whatever. Like this is a very complicated can of worms. It's not worth going down and however much time we have left. 
but uh, I think this is uh, something for people to consider in terms of applying to their own lives as best as they can. Yes. Uh, and I, that seemed to be somewhat in line with what you were talking about, the peaks and valleys. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I did go – I went to this one church once here in Austin that they used that from for a, for a metaphor. The the sermon was – I only went to that church one time yet. It was one of the most memorable sermons I had. It was, it, it was called From the Pit to the Palace. And it talked about how Joseph went to, from the pit to the palace – Part part of it was be, because he was leading this life. Now it's an interesting theological issue that I hear different people on different views about how much we can control what happens next. Some people say you control everything in your life, yet other people say God controls everything. And then there's a lot of people in the middle. So it's interesting for that. So it can vary on your theology based on how much Joseph's actions led to the certain consequences, or whether. God was preparing Joseph. In either case, it goes to show that if you live right, you're, you might have more drastic ups and downs because people who don't challenge themselves, they're, like that book says, they're going to be in a plateau. And if you, you, you'll be in the valley. You may be living a better life, yet it seems like temporarily they're better than you, but you're going to be up to the peak someday. Yeah. And, and that's the way yeah, with I mean, politics, too. Politics are cycles like that, too. So sometimes alternative parties do better than others, and then they have their downs and ups. So, yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that that goes with uh, many levels of arcs of history. I mean, you were uh, bringing it back to the, uh, third parties, and good on you, uh <laughs> Uh, for that maneuver, but I don't know. There are some people that think that uh, history is cyclical, and uh. I'm not sure if I completely agree with that uh, or not. But like right now, there's if we're talking about third parties specifically, uh, or or actually any alternative, you know, whether it's Bernie Sanders or Donald Trump or whatever, it's like there's a very clear very clear motivations to like a massive scale that the establishment uh, powers as they are are not interested mm-hmm. in allowing this and some people are like oh you know america is already lost and this sort of thing and you know that might be the case i honestly don't know what the his or the the future holds but i would point out that you know there's been a lot of dark times in our history you know, actually bringing up, uh, coming back to some of the stuff that you were talking about, uh, racial injustice and stuff is like, you know, there's a lot of people these days who are fond of pointing out that the founding, a lot of the founding fathers, for example, uh, owned slaves. Yeah. Uh, most of them think this is an attempt to undermine the country, which I don't mm. uh, really appreciate. Uh, but, uh, in a sense, actually, um, I kind of see this challenge as an opportunity because, yes, there was hypocrisy. Uh, and, uh, yeah, that isn't ideal. But I think it's worth noting that a lot of them recognized that at the time, and there were a lot of them who wanted to get rid of uh, slavery from the outset, but there wasn't uh, a sufficient majority to get it done. Hmm. And so they were like, okay, well, we're basically kicking the can down the road. We'll fight the revolution and come back to this later. And eventually they, we did come back to it, it later. And, yeah, uh, it took time. Uh, it wasn't a uh, pleasant experience. Uh, but it's like, you know, for all the complaints that people have about this country, and I certainly have many of them myself, people from all over the world want to come here, <laughs> right? Like, there's countries that people flee, and there's countries that people flee to, and this is one of the latter, right? And and so the thing is, it's like, yes, uh, there was slavery, and yes, we had to go through civil rights and stuff, but – and the, the uh, fathers were hypocrites, but the ideals that they were uh, putting down in, in the ground and uh, as the basis for this country led to the abolition of slavery and, le- and, and uh, civil rights, and especially with civil rights uh, – you know, this was basically a direct consequence because the whole point uh, or underlying uh, strategy of the uh, civil rights movements was basically to call the country to its own standard. And I think there's a cynical uh, aspect of this because uh, – not for civil rights, but uh, 
I don't know if you know Saul Alinsky. I need to read that. I've got it on my shelf. I haven't got around to it. There's a book called Rules for Radicals. It's um, Oh, yeah. It's, it's, it's kind of it's generally considered the opposite of Matthew Valley, which I've also read. Um, but uh, supposedly one of the things in there, uh, well, there's accuse your enemies of that, what you were doing, which obviously there's people doing that uh, cynically. Uh, I believe it, it also has the idea of like, oh, hold your uh, enemies to their own standards. And to some degree, I think that's true. But one issue that I see is it seems there's a lot of people who don't have any standards uh, and mm-hmm. are cynically uh, using that as a weapon. And I think I'm not I don't think I've thought that uh, fully through uh, what the appropriate response of it that is. But there is a grain of truth or devil in the details of uh this that is probably positive and I, I think the civil rights example is a good one of that where it's like yeah uh, the country was not living up to the standards on and ideals for which it's was built but because we had them like that was the motivation impetus and you know uh to way to resolve that and so the situation that we have now uh, i would argue that we have neither capitalism nor uh, a republic, um, as hmm. some people would say, democracy. Obviously, we don't have that either. Uh, technically speaking, we weren't intended to. And in a way, this is really worrying because it looks in a lot of ways like the entire Western world is sliding towards a more totalitarian situation. And hmm. uh, But in a, and we might. It could be bad, right? Like we could all end up like China where it's like, oh, you have a social credit score, and if you say anything the government doesn't like, you don't you can't leave your house or have a job and we'll cancel your uh, bank accounts or whatever. Like there's some crazy stuff going on in the world that could really go sideways in a, yeah. you know, nightmare scenario. But at the same time, you know, if you look at history, uh, in a sense, I would think, well, okay, I'm going to back up a little bit. Uh, are you are you familiar with uh, Noam Chomsky and the manufacture of consent? I've, I've I've consumed some of his stuff. I wouldn't say a lot of it, a little bit. So uh, I think it was the late 70s or early 80s. I I can't remember precisely when uh, it was that he was writing this. Uh, But basically, you know, he recognized, let's say that you're watching television in the late 70s, right? You're yeah. going to see a, uh, the, the news comes on and, you know, there's a story about a war going on and some new drug coming to market and a couple other things, right? And you think like, oh, I'm watching the news and I'm becoming informed. Uh, no, <laughs> because basically all of the media companies in the country were uh, owned by one of six companies as part of these large corporate, corporate conglomerates. And what you don't mm-hmm. realize when you're watching the news is that uh, the war story that they're covering, the – uh, parent company of the media company also owns the military contractor that's like building the bombs and really they're promoting support for the war on which they're making money. Uh, the new drug that's coming to market, the parent company of the media company also owns the pharmaceutical company that's making that drug. And by adver- or putting it as a news story rather than a paid advertisement, first of all, it's free, uh, but also it bypasses laws where they have to uh, list side effects and stuff. And so you think you're watching the news, but you're not. Like, it's just an hour of propaganda for whatever uh, the corporate structure is. And you can change the channel, but they're all that way, right? So, and, and that was, you know, back in the uh, 50 years ago, right? Like, how much more uh, has that changed? But the thing that's happened, really, is we've had a revolution with technology that's similar to the invention of writing, with uh, the internet and that's allowed normal people or the printing press is another good example. And if you look at, uh, there was a TED talk years ago by this guy, Clay Shirky at around 2010 or so, I think. And mm-hmm. he was like, Oh, we're all pro printing press. He's like, the people thought the printing press was going to bring, uh, you know, Catholic hegemony and world peace. And instead it brought the 95 thesis in the 30 years war. And he's like, you know, this always, he's like looking at mean comments of YouTube or whatever at the time and being like, you know, this, this always happens. And the other thing that happens too is it's like, you know, uh, porn, when they invented the novel or, you know, printing press, the erotic novel was like instantaneous, but it took 150 years to come up with the scientific journal. <laughs> um, but, but anyway, the, the point is, is like, uh, we, I don't think we've had, uh, 
rep real representation in this country for a very long time, and this uh -huh. is by design uh, because effectively opinion control in an air quotes democracy is cheaper than a dictatorship. So as long as they can convince people, uh, oh, they're controlling the information, which was easy to do for most of the 20th century, because you might have some local reporters, but nationally the entire agenda was set by one of three television stations, basically, that, you know, were syndicated in whatever local areas. And so, uh, you know, this continues to this this day. And, uh, man, I – Actually, there's one uh, thing I, um, slight tangent that I did want to bring up in the conversation. Okay. Uh, you've had multiple guests on. Uh, one thing that you might consider in the future is actually having uh, some of your guests on uh, to talk to each other because uh, I'm gonna. I'll be honest. Uh, it would be interesting to see. Uh, man, I apologize. Okay. So. Are you okay there? Yeah, okay, it's okay. I uh, forget that uh, tangent. The point is, is we're in a bad situation in a way, but in another sense, I think it's positive because people are increasingly realizing whether, you know, they're rigging the election against Bernie Sanders or they're, you know, trying to kick Trump off of the ballot. I mean, dude, 20 years ago, they wouldn't even let Nader participate in the debates, which, man, if you want a wake-up call, watch the documentary Ralph Nader, The Unreasonable Man. You don't have yeah. to like Nader or his policies uh, to see, just, you know, just how rigged the system was, and that was 20 years ago. So, you know, like Trump or hate him, the idea that these people are above rigging an election, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> Well, you know, whether that happened or not is another conversation. But, uh, but, the th but the ultimate point here is, is like, yeah, this could go sideways. But in a way, it's also an opportunity because the Western powers that be have been preaching about capitalism and democracy like forever. And in a sense, it's like all you know, the all we really have to do is kind of hold them to their own standard and be like, well, now that there's the internet here, you know, we can see how many different types of people. Uh, are not really being represented by uh, by the system that we have, <laughs> uh, and so and it, it might take a long time. It might be uh, quite painful. I I can't tell you what's going to happen, uh, and like I said, it could end up rather badly. But I think the best thing is like that Joseph story is to be like you know try keep trying to do the best that you can, and yeah. uh, there is some impetus in history to think that uh, you know good can win eventually. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and that does get back to that peaks and valleys thing because nations have peaks and valleys just like individuals do. And it, I read this book called Soul of a Citizen by Paul Rogret Loeb, and he says when we look back at history, we, we tend to think of the things that happened as inevitable, that they had to be that way, like the civil rights movement had to occur. And in our perspective, it seems like, duh, that was the right thing. But he said at the time, there's usually a lot of struggle and a lot of dis disagreements and a lot of people thinking that it might not happen and people wondering that may happen. And in our lifetime, we have gone through things that we didn't know how we're ending. What do we just come out of? A pandemic, March of 2020 seems 100 years away now. But remember then, at, in March of 2020, before masks, before stimulus checks, before vaccines, people were in pandemonium. We weren't knowing what's going to happen. The grocery stores then were, people were hoarding toilet paper, and people were raiding the grocery stores of everything. So we didn't know what was going to happen. And a lot of tragedy and death happened along the way, and we did get through it. So that goes to show that just like in World War II, there were very some dark times. There was there was points in World War Two. It looked like the Nazis were going to win. So mm -hmm. Winston Churchill, despite his many faults, he had the weight of Western civilization on his shoulders. So it looked very bleak for him, but he did press on. And although the UK is not the perfect country, it's better than Nazi Germany. So it's a good thing that they beat Nazi Germany. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I know this is maybe a slight change in uh, tone or uh, topic, but uh, there is one thing that I – I mean, honestly, 
there are so many topics that would be interesting uh, to discuss, uh, but uh, yeah, we have uh, somewhat limited time. So I yeah. sort of made a mental checklist, or there are all things that I would definitely like to bring up. And uh, I think at the top of my list, besides asking about you yourself, was uh, a particular suggestion of a way that I think that we could make or start helping the world to become a better place in general uh, and okay. especially politically without okay. actually even uh, taking any particular action, uh, regardless of what your point of view is. Uh, and that is, I think it's well past time to reject the left-right paradigm. Hmm. Now, I know there's going to be a lot of people uh, who are going to uh, object to this, and uh, not without good reason. There is some uh, usefulness uh, in this uh, view and certainly there are uh, tri there's a certain amount of tribalism that uh, lands on uh, what is colloquially called left or right or liberal conservative or whatever. But mm -hmm. okay, here's a, uh, an example: to liberal and conservative are not opposites. Hmm. Even just the words, think about it. Right? What's the opposite of liberal? Liberal is the you know, same shares the same root word as liberty. So uh, the opposite of that is like, you know, uh, lack of freedom. Like, actually, originally liberal, uh, classical liberal was closer to libertarian. So yeah. this is a, like a libertarian uh, authoritarian uh, dichotomy. And yeah. conservative, what's that mean? It's uh, conservative is conservation. That is like, oh, preserving things that uh, are working or have value. And the opposite mm -hmm. of that is change, not – and so – uh, these are not opposites. They're orthogonal or perpendicular, uh, okay. if that makes sense. Uh, and so, and actually, this comes to my core thesis, which is that politics is not really a one-dimensional line uh, between two points in space. It's a much higher dimensional space of True. orthogonal or perpendicular values and issues. And so, when you use words like left and right, there's some utility in this because to some degree people know what you mean, but to a lot of degrees they don't, right? Like the, the left and right doesn't literally mean anything. Which side is uh, for war or against war? Well, under Bush, the air quotes right was for war, and under, uh, you know, uh, Biden uh, or uh, Obama, it was like the left. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's almost more like, oh, who is in charge of the war matters more than, you know, it's like, are you actually, and to be fair, there's people who are consistently anti-war, right? Yeah. And there's people who are consistently uh, for war. But, like, that isn't, a, so, you know, that's a, another thing. It's like, oh, uh, or doves and hawks, uh, like, neither of those, no, nothing. You cannot pick anything, whether it's uh, being pro or anti-science. Like, you can find stuff on either end of the spectrum that it follows that and you know there's a lot of people think well really it's like a horseshoe that the extremes wrap around and no 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 this is a the problem is you have one dimensional thinking right most people you know you can understand the concept of a line i think uh if you've graduated from high school you probably at a minimum know of you know two dimensions for graphing like lines and parabolas and stuff, and if you have any experience with 3D, uh, you know, graphics or video games or something, you probably know X, Y, and Z. Like, so think of a higher, dim and, you know, for the, those more math inclined, you know that there's basically infinite dimensions that can all be perpendicular. You just add more numbers to the vector, uh, which I, I won't go to on for people who aren't uh, math geeks. But the point is, is, you know, what when people think that there's some wraparound with the horseshoe, what's really happening is, you've got one axis on which whatever things are opposites, and then you have another perpendicular axis uh, on which, on that axis, they're basically right next to each other or perhaps the same. They're not wrapped around. It's just people are, you're thinking one-dimensionally, and if you get rid of that, uh, I think it opens up a whole lot more possibilities for people to understand what's going on uh, because really what we care about are individual values and you know, how to resolve specific issues, and in a sense, having, I mean, to be fair, I think there's both an organic and inorganic component to the creation of the left-right paradigm. Uh -huh. Some of it is the fact that in the United States, we have a basically first past the goalpost voting system, which basically necessitates two parties because uh, basically you end up having to form coalitions of all these different groups 
you know, to be heard. Uh, Europe is somewhat different. Uh, they, like I lived in Germany for a while, and they have five parties, uh, really. Uh, and, you know, then they have a more proportional representation. There's pros and cons to that, although I yeah. would point out they're having the exact same problems where it's like, oh, you have some very popular uh, other party that's not part of the traditional establishment that's representing things that none of the regular parties will and effectively trying to outlaw them. Whether you like uh, those alternatives or not is not really the point. Uh, you know, so uh, I'm not saying that uh, making multiple – getting rid of the two-party system is the entirety of, of the, solving the problem, but – you know, the real point is, is like, well, how are we actually identifying things? Because you can have, if we can separate stuff and sort of, and, and this comes back to the inorganic parts, I think in part the either or fallacy uh, of the left-right paradigm is to some degree to almost the same as Ingsoc in 1984. So in 1984, basically they have a, a language that people speak and they deliberately remove words from the language to control thought and to limit what pe kinds of thoughts people are capable of having. And I feel, uh, regardless if it's on purpose or on accident or some combination of both, the left-right paradigm does this to people because what does left and right even mean? Like I said, who's for or against war? Who's for or against science? Like, you know, uh, there's a lot of things that it just doesn't make sense. And so what you end up getting is this, uh, split in the population, and it's not. Con uh, I think it's not an accident that it's split almost directly in half. You know, wow. it's like you listen to people, and you go like, it doesn't matter if you're listening to left or right uh, people. They'll be like, oh, you know, our politicians, they just can't seem to get it over the line and do the right thing, or they make a bunch of promises, but then they don't really deliver. And it's like, well, they're not trying to. They're not trying to deliver. Like, they're just getting you on board. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter if you're a progressive uh, person or, uh, you know, somebody complaining about the rhinos, right? It's the same thing. And it's because, like, they're not even trying to, you know, they're trying to, they're controlling you. It's not the other way around. And it's by that, by design, because basically they're just trying to cut the population in half and keep everyone fighting about abortion and gay rights and guns like whatever sort of non-economical things that they can think of. And then they, like George Carlin says, was like, oh, they run off with all the cash, you know. <laughs> like that's that's the game, right? And so sure. uh, if we're going to solve this, you have to recognize, like, what's really going on. And the only way that you do that is by having conversations with people uh, because the reality is it doesn't matter. Like, you know, if I'm talking to somebody who's very progressive, uh, you know, Actually, I would say probably the strength of a progressive person is that they understand that concept, at least to some degree on their own side, that they're like, you know, they rigged this, the thing against Bernie Sanders and the uh, Democrats aren't delivering this uh, or whatever. Like, you know, I can have disagreements about them with other stuff. And, it, you know, it's similar with, you know, somebody who's complaining about uh, the rhino types. It's like, oh, you know, uh, they just can't win. It's like, oh, they do this. And then they shoot themselves in the foot. It's like, yeah, because – Man, behind the scenes, the the political class, man, they they went to the same schools. I'll tell you a story, man. So I worked in uh, video games for a bunch of my career, and at one point I had an interview uh, with Rockstar that makes uh, GTA and uh, Red Dead Redemption. Yeah. And that I interviewed in was in uh, Andover, which is just outside of Boston. And uh -huh. the claims of fame in, An in Andover was that they had a high school there, a high school that boasted graduating many United States presidents. And this was just before the financial crash in 2008 or right around uh, that time. And it cost, at that time, before all the inflation that was created with the bailouts and whatnot, they were charging 40 grand a year for high school, okay? But think about that, right? It's like, okay, if you go to this high school, you're going to be friends with uh, future congressmen, senators, CEOs, maybe president of the United States. Uh -huh. But that's, that's, that's 160 grand to go to high school. You ever, you're not even talking about, well, now you go to Ivy League after that, right? So it's like, it's like George Carlin said, and I, you know, I grew up in a friggin' trailer park <laughs> with no running water as a kid. And so, you know, I've seen this spectrum, right? And it's been, 
and there's some truth in what, you know, George Carlin was saying. It's like, there's a big club, and you're not in it, <laughs> right? And so it's not about left and right anymore, right? Like sure. all the stuff about like, racial inequality and stuff and sex. Uh, look, I'm not saying that those issues don't or haven't existed, but what I am telling you is that uh, all of that stuff is deliberately used to divide us, right? If you look at the history, even in the South, right, because the South had segregation, and I'm absolutely opposed to that. But what people don't realize nowadays is they think, like, oh, it's that this was a popular opinion that, like, everyone just, you know, hated the blacks and didn't want them in their establishment or something. It's like, no. Look, think about it. Imagine you ran a restaurant, right? Okay. Uh, you have to clean, clean twice as many bathrooms and twice as many water fountains and have twice as, uh, you know, cut your seating in half and turning away paying customers who come in because – the session for their race is full, right? You want money. This is not – but the problem is if you don't do it, right, uh, well, they'll call it the cops who will turn up faster than if you violated COVID restrictions, and then Antifa – I mean, I'm sorry, the Klan will turn up and burn your shit down. <laughs> like, it's, man, things have not changed since we were building the pyramids, right? The, the pogroms, Crystal Knox, George Floyd, like this pattern repeats. And I'm not saying that there aren't injustices. There absolutely are. But what you have to recognize is that, like, they're just keeping us divided, right? And so if you could break past that paradigm and be like, look, uh, you know, yes, we have our differences, but people are not as different as you think. If you actually start ha talking with them and having real conversations, and honestly, it, if I can make one suggestion for your podcast, it would be to have some of your guests back and try to get them to talk to each other because, you know, I, I've been listening to a bunch of your episodes in the last few days, and I really feel like basically there was nobody that came on there that in which it wouldn't be interesting to have conversations about, like, where we differ and, you know, uh, what things we have that are the same. And, okay. like, this right. is how to, to start solving problems. I also I'd like to give a shout out to the guy that was uh, the free domain party. I think he had this uh, thing that he was talking about or voting on money, and this is an uh, idea that me and a friend had in around 2010. And I think that uh, man, there's a deeper solution there that is, you know, uh, <laughs> and other people too, man. Whether they're talking about transhumanism or whatever, like how you how we solve problems and, and fix things. Uh, is figuring that figuring these things out, and that that's what the First Amendment is for, right? It's not just so the Nazis can talk or whatever, you know, the reason they use to try to shut it down. Yeah, there's just uh, bad people out there, and they're lying or doing other things to incite problems, and that isn't all from you know just uh, some fringe extreme. The legacy media, whether it's corporate or state media, does the exact same thing very maliciously. Once you understand the game that they're playing. But really, it's so that we can talk and come to uh, understanding and figure out how to solve real world problems. And that's mm -hmm. what's so beautiful about what you're doing here is like you're getting a bunch of different people with a lot of different points of views who have ideas. Yep. Some of them are good. Some of them are not so good. Man, that's excellent. Dude. This is exactly what we need to be doing. And in my opinion, the next step then is like, okay, how do you get different combinations of those uh, people to come together and figure out like, okay, uh, this part of your idea is really good. We should try to work on that. This part doesn't work because you don't understand this or that about economics, or maybe I don't, or, you know. And so, anyway. Uh, but, yeah, I think it starts with just saying, like, this left-right paradigm, this doesn't make any sense, even for the outset. Left and right don't mean anything concrete to us. It doesn't tell you whether, uh, you know, you want 0% wealth redistribution or 100 or somewhere where, or where in between you fall. Uh, on that, sure. right? It's there's a bunch of stereotypes that people have in their head, uh, but they vary, you know, between different people, uh, or and over time, and between different countries. And also, I mean, really, these terms come from the French Revolution, where people segregated themselves into two wings of a tennis court. That, to make a very long story short, was about whether or not they should ask the king. <laughs> and uh, spoiler alert: in the end, they did, which uh, had pros and cons. But you know, that's a long story. So, sure. Anyway, uh, if I could only make one point uh, in my time here, that would be it. I think I'd make right. perspectives on all kinds of other things from, uh, you know, how to resolve the abortion thing to uh, I think most people don't understand economics enough. 
uh, that honestly going into that would be our set, my second point if we had time today or some other day. But okay. honestly, it's not even about me, really. The, the real thing is, is like, can you break the mental paradigm, whether you want to call it the matrix or whatever else that you're in, and recognize the world in which you're a part of and that, you know, uh, someone that you think is in a different tribe than you is not necessarily your enemy, you know, uh, like they're going to have things on which you disagree and they're going to have, but there's also a lot of stuff you can agree on. And if you find the commonalities, like, you know, this is the thing too, that's like all this pushing of diversity. Yeah. It's in the sense, it's good to have a diverse amount of opinions. And that includes, uh, you know, people who've had difficulties from race or uh, religion or sexuality or, or whatever, but there's the cynical aspect to it that like, Man, if you keep people divided in race in your company, well, they're not going to organize to, like, improve wages or whatever, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and and so, like, that's the game that's being played on, on you, right? It's like um, – and you have to re- you have to recognize that. Uh, and once you do and say, like, oh, you know, somebody can have a polar opposite view on me on some things but identical to another so we can work together on the parts that we agree with, and then on the parts where we disagree, well, I mean, A, you could ignore it, and that's something if you're at least working on a common goal. But uh, even better would be to actually eventually hash those out as a secondary measure uh, and figure out, well, where am I wrong? Where are they wrong? And, you know, there's some – I wouldn't say truth in the middle. It's a higher dimension again, right? Like if you see a triangle – or sorry, a, a circle, and I see a, a square – like it's not halfway in the middle. It's it's a higher dimensional space where it's. Like, mm-hmm. And I have to credit Eric Weinstein for that uh, analogy. I actually had thought of this concept of higher dimensional space before I heard that, but I, that's the best analogy, right? It's like if if we're each looking at a cylinder side on or or top down, you know, one of us is going to see a circle and the other one's a square, and neither of us are wrong, but we're not right either. It's actually a combination of our views that it's not halfway in the middle. It's it's a higher dimensional space. Mm-hmm. And if we can get past uh, focusing on differences, start with the commonalities and uh, how to, then we can resolve differences. It's so if we start with the differences, like we're just going to be fighting all the time. And then, you know, as George Carlin says, uh, the big club runs off with all the cash <laughs> and leaves us, you know, with our junk in our hands. So. All right. Well, we thank you for coming on the podcast today and sharing your perspective and sharing your views. Yeah, man, uh, anytime. Uh, even if you don't invite me back, though, uh, I encourage you to consider trying those conversations between different combinations of guests. Uh, you know, the, the First Amendment, Vox Populi, Vox Dei, you know, uh, logos, however you want to put it, like this is the beginning of our our solutions and uh, sure. those things were considered divine by various uh, cultures and whatnot for a reason. And yeah. we, we've forgotten that, but it's the, the solution that, uh, or the beginning It's how we come to solutions. So man, thanks so much for having me on and uh, props again for what you're doing. I, I really believe in the direction that you're already going. And I, I think there's enormous potential. I, I can't promise you're going to become Joe Rogan or Lex Friedman or somebody, but the work that you're doing, in my opinion, is very, absolutely important. So well, thank you, sir. I appreciate keep that. Good, keep up the good work. <laughs> thank you. And we wish you all the best no problem, as man. well and what you do, too. May you keep up the good work as well. Thank you. All right. Take care and all the best. Perfect. Talk to you later. Bye.